Hi there, Terry here with another episode of the Animation Industry Podcast. Today I'm chatting with the super esteemed John Musker, who's known for directing Moana, The Princess and the Frog, Treasure Planet, and many other films. And I found today's chat really inspiring because sometimes when I read Wikipedia articles about the great animators and directors, their accomplishments just seem so unattainable. Like, how can I ever reach that level myself? But hearing John's story firsthand really helped ground things for me because he started off really just like anyone else with a love for drawing. And of course, he took a lot of risks and developed a lot of skills and relationships along the way. But for me to hear that and and the dream I'm currently following, talking with people like John really helped me gain more confidence that I'm on the right path and can accomplish amazing things too. And I actually met John at the Taffy Conference after party a month back and asked him to be on this podcast and he said yes. And if you're not aware, Taffy stands for Toronto Animated Arts Festival International and it's a yearly conference that happens here in Toronto. And of course, it's a fantastic place to meet other animators and people like John or even me. So I definitely recommend you check out your local animation conference if you're not in Toronto because it can be a really valuable experience. So John is going to share how he got his start at Disney and worked his way up. He'll also share how he ended up directing his first film and what elements he's learned make for a really captivating story, plus his best advice for others pursuing a career like his. But first, I have a sponsored message to share with you. And it comes from my friends over at Bloop Animation, which is an animation learning platform packed with premium online video courses for aspiring animation filmmakers. So they have courses for all major animation programs like Maya, Animate CC, Toon Boom, Blender, TV Paint, and many others, as well as some non-software courses like a storyboarding course, animation foundations course, and even one about making graphic novels, which covers absolutely everything you need to know from start to finish. And their courses are all in video form, so there are no deadlines or application process. You simply just pick a course and you can start learning in seconds. They even offer a free ebook titled Making an Animated Short, which covers their entire process step by step of how they made one of their films from coming up with the idea to storyboarding, animation, and all the way to exporting the film. And you can get that book for free at bloopanimation.com slash animation industry. And you can check out their complete course library at bloopanimation.com slash courses. And I'm going to include both those links in the description of this podcast. So please check that out. Now back to today's episode. So I already mentioned I'm interviewing John Musker today, but I just want to give him a few more credits because he's added his expertise to so many projects that have been loved by millions all over the world, including me. So besides directing Moana and the other films I mentioned, he was also a character animator on The Rescuers, The Fox and the Hound. He also directed The Great Mouse Detective, The Little Mermaid, and Hercules. Plus he's added his creative input on tons of other projects like Bolt, Big Hero 6, and even the most recent Aladdin that came out in 2019. So without further ado, let's jump right into the chat. Hi, John. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How are you today? I'm good, Terry. I understand there's quite a bit of snow on the ground up in Toronto. Yeah, you, that's right. You used the word gross. I've never heard the word gross in connection with snow other than amounts of snow. But uh, Well, uh, you know, it's wet and you get your boots yeah. all wet it's and good, stuff. It's a good it. packing. Can you make a good snowball out of it? Today, yes. Yeah, you could. Okay. So, All right. Well, that's that's good then. Yeah, um, well, yes, I was saying there is a little bit of snow on our hills here. We're recording this around uh, just after the American holiday known as Thanksgiving. Uh, right. And uh, there was a uh, snow that hit the hills right above where I live. So I can look out the window and see white dotting hills. It's very pretty and kind of Christmassy in its own way. Well, that's that's very nice, and that's a treat, I guess, for you down there. It is. It's a novelty for you. It's an ordeal, but for us, it's a treat, yeah. right? So, I'm from Chicago. It's a little bit nostalgic, you know. I think, hey, that's uh, there's my hometown. Except there are no mountains where I live. Chicago is as flat as a pancake. But uh, other than that, it's it's a tiny bit like Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm I'm very happy you agreed to be on the podcast. So, thank you for coming on. And um, I wanted to chat about your career because you've had a a very industrious career over the years and been involved in many of the most like, successful like yeah, right. Disney films. So can you just tell me the story of how you ended up in the animation in this industry in the first place? Uh, I can. Um, I was interested in animation as a kid. You know, I, uh, back, of course, I am, I, uh, my birthday was about a month ago. I turned 66 years old. Oh my gosh, how can you be that old? But I am. Um, and so, um, 
As a kid, though, I saw Disney features in theaters, you know, and I saw Sleeping Beauty when it first came out in 1959. I was like six years old. And that was a very powerful impression it made on me. You know, the the prince riding and, you know, on a, across a drawbridge that's falling apart and battling a dragon and fairies, you know, the different color uh, magical soot coming out of chimneys and all that. It was fascinating to me. I saw... Um, 101 Dalmatians also at a tender age that fell into my, you know, my wheelhouse in, in terms of its original release. I think it was 10 years old. I think uh, Sword in the Stone, uh, I think some friends went with me on my birthday to see the movie or something like that, if I'm remembering it right. I don't know. But uh, but I grew up, I, I was interested in animation. I drew as a kid, and like many kids do. I think, in fact, I think most kids draw, and then somehow it gets beaten out of them. I don't know what happens, but uh, they're told that they you don't draw well enough or they they lose interest. It's it's a sad thing because I think kids, uh, by their nature, like to draw. <clears throat> so, so I I at an early age I actually I watched the Mickey Mouse Club on TV and I saw the, you know, and I learned a little bits about animation here and there. But I learned that there was this book called The Art of Animation, written by Bob Thomas, which talked about Sleeping Beauty somewhat. I did not have a copy of that book, but there was a library, a public library, that did have a copy. So I checked that book out many times. And it actually gave you a window into the world of animation. And it talked about how they made those kinds of films. And I was reading this as like, you know, an eight-year-old, but I was fascinated by the process. And it seemed like a cool way. I, I think I was always drawn to drawing and to fantasy, certainly, too, and filmmaking. I mean, movies made a big impression on me. I saw The Wizard of Oz every year at Christmas, you know, on TV, and it had a powerful impact. I was terrified of uh, The Witch, even into my adulthood, practically, I... Yeah, it's embarrassing to admit, but really a very primal movie for me. But other movies were as well. So I, I love the nature of those kind of, you know, telling stories. And I love to draw. Uh, and uh, and my mother, I would say, my parents, neither my father, he worked for the telephone company. He was not an artist or anything like that. But he was a very funny guy. And he was a very smart guy. And he was a, a good uh, dad. And so he supported my drawing. But my mother was uh, creative, I would say. She she painted a bit, and she she raised eight kids. I'm one of eight kids, but uh, but she definitely had creative instincts. When she th put on a party, she always built it around some kind of theme, and she, you know, just had very an interest. And she sang around the house and things like that. So she was a a creative person, and she was very supportive of anything I did creatively. So I would enter poster contests, you know, as a, a nine year old. And I think I won the John's Pizza poster contest so i think i got a 25 dollars savings bond for that one so uh, i don't think i still have the poster and i can't remember what i did but uh so anyway so i got i got reinforcement when i did drawings that if people liked them it was a good feeling because you know it, it connected with people um so i uh there are many things though that i was interested in many forms of drawing i, I was interested in editorial cartooning i was interested in comic books comic strips all those things and really um and then i wound up majoring in english in high school I mean, rather, in, I went to a, a, a Jesuit uh, prep school where, you know, experienced all things except art. They had no art classes at my Catholic high school, so so there was no drawing. So any drawing I had, I, I did some summer classes a little bit, and then it was self-taught, which I felt most cartooning was. So as I'm heading toward college, um, I was uh, cautioned by the Jesuits to try not to get vocational too fast in my college experience, to really get a well-rounded humanities-based education which would serve me well in any number of pursuits. I mean, this wasn't just me. This was everybody they were telling this. And uh, and I sort of thought I agreed with that somewhat because I felt like the kind of cartooning and drawing I, I wanted to do were going to be self-taught anyway. And yet I thought, I want to kind of read the great books, but I'm way too lazy to do it on my own. So, uh, so I majored in English. I went to Northwestern University. I was an English major. And the great thing was it was a very much, you know, it's a humanities, a liberal arts school. So... I got to also attend art history classes and film history classes. So I got to talk to this uh, Peter Wallen, a wonderful film teacher who showed, you know, the French New Wave and showed, uh, uh, you know, Orson Welles and Kane and all sorts of things and really opened my eyes up to a lot of filmmaking type stuff, even though I wasn't really a film student. And uh, so that was good. And in the meantime, I'm reading these great books and trying to learn something from that. And an occasional art drawing class, very barely, minimum. But I also was a, an editorial cartoonist for the uh, Daily Northwestern while I was there, which I did in high school as well. I did a weekly editorial cartoon. Um, anyway, so as I'm about to get out of school now and think, now how, what do I do to make an actual living? I mean, do I sort of think I probably need to make money? And I really didn't want to continue my schooling because I felt like I was a somewhat introverted guy, despite 
me running off at the mouth right now. I, I in my family of uh, five sisters, uh, many of whom we talked a fair amount. I didn't have to say much around there, so so I, I grew up kind of a, a quiet guy, I would say. Um, but I and I was afraid if I went to school, I might remain a quiet guy my entire life. You know that I might be uh, somehow retreat into academia, and never never enter the real world because I was too comfortable in my home life and my academic life. So um, so I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And at, around this time, there were like three big events that happened to me that influenced my decision. One was. Uh, in I think it was 1972, Dick Williams, who just passed away recently, the great animator, you know, in his 80s, um, he, there was a retrospective of his, his films at the Chicago International Film Festival, the highlight of which was going to be a showing of The Christmas Carol, a half-hour special that he did for ABC Television, which Chuck Jones was the executive producer of. So I went to the, his retrospective. I saw all his short films. I saw his title sequences. And I went and I saw, I heard him talk. It was over a series of days. It wasn't just one event. And I kept going. It was downtown. I rode the bus across town, went to this thing and all that. I lived on the other side of Chicago. Uh, and uh, it was really fascinating to me. And uh, and he was a very uh, powerful uh, advocate for animation, hand-drawn animation, and really kind of full animation, classical, if you will, animation a la Disney, a la, you know, the great Warner Brothers and MGM cartoons. He really was a, a proponent of that, despite his own animation, so it being kind of limited because that's what was done in that day, but he really loved full animation and was doing more and more of it. Um, so he spoke very powerfully and he talked about his own studio in London, so much so that there were people in the audience raising their hand, can I come and work for you and all that? And I almost had that feeling too, wow, what an, what an adventure that would be to go to London and work in animation and learn something about this art form that's so amazing. Anyway, uh, that was one thing. Then flash forward about a year later, Chuck Jones came to speak at Northwestern. They had an animation festival there showing all sorts of animation, multi-day event. And Chuck himself, the man who I, I grew up watching Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers cartoons on television in Chicago in the afternoons and in the morning. And I saw much of his work and I knew who Chuck Jones was. And, uh, and so he came and spoke and he spoke very powerfully about uh, the, one of the big things was that I recall is that he, it seemed like he communicated that you could be his age, which is his age then. He was in his 60s, I think, and and still feel like you are learning things about animation. It wasn't like, you know, you have it all and then you just are executing over and over again. No, no, it's a continual process. Even as a 20-year-old hearing that, that was appealing to me. I thought, wow, that makes animation seem like, an, you know, something that might be worth pursuing. The third event in the trifecta here was Christopher Finch published, or Abrams published the big coffee table book on Disney. There had never been anything like that, really. It was The Art of Walt Disney. And in that book, Christopher Finch talked about a lot of the animators and gave them names, Frank Thomas, Holly Johnson, Ward Kimball, Eric Larson, and said what they did in these different films and what they were good at and had little stills. And I had seen these films, so I knew some of that work. And But suddenly now there was a person who created that. And my dreams I had at seven of possibly being an animator for Disney, because as a kid, that's what I thought I might want to do. And then I drifted away from that. Those dreams were kind of reawakened at that time. And I thought... Um, this might be a neat career to get into. So I wrote to Disney because uh, in Finch's book, he said they had a training program for young animators because the truth of it was that Disney had been a closed shop for 30 years and everybody there was, there are a few people not in their 60s, but most of the key creative people were in their 60s and ready to retire kind of. And if they didn't resupply people, uh, the whole studio might fold. Jungle Book came out in 1967. It was a big hit. Walt Disney had died in 66, leaving no apparent plan for his successor or what to do with the animation department or anything. So the powers that be there then said, well, if we don't get younger people into this, the whole thing is going to fold. So they started an in-house training program. So that's what I read about. And so I, they said, you can mail a portfolio there and you can uh, try and get accepted. So I did. I, I sent them a portfolio of my drawings. They wanted animal drawings. Do I tell my terrible story that I've told it every single thing and it's a joke, but it's true? that, you know, I was never around animals, so I had to, and I was freezing trying to draw them at the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago in February when I was putting together my portfolio, so I went to the Natural History Museum, I drew the dioramas, they had, you know, the ibex from Africa, and the, this and the that, and I <clears throat> sealed them away in my portfolio, sent it off to Disney, waited to get word back, waited a few weeks, did get word back, they rejected me, they didn't want me in their training program, because uh, among other things, my animal drawings were too stiff, you know, but, uh, it was like they could well, not be stiffer. I drew them as I saw them. They were like, eh, you know, 
<clears throat> now I understand what they were looking for. At the time, I thought, I drew what they looked like. Isn't that enough? But, you know, drawing a posed animal that is has no weight, really. I mean, they try and give it weight in their dioramas, and good taxidermists can do that, I guess. But anyway, I was like, uh-oh, my grand plan is falling apart before my very eyes. Um, I proceeded to put together a portfolio of comic book pages for Marvel Comics, which I also love, sent them a portfolio. They rejected me, too. They said, you don't draw well enough. Don't darken our door again. I'm like, oh, no, I'm over, too. I kind of went, hit the road a little bit downtown Chicago, went to some newspapers, tried to show my stuff. They weren't particularly interested. I'm like, wow, what am I What am I going to do? <laughs> I'm, my plan is falling apart in front of me. Um, but then I got another letter from Disney that said, maybe you want to send your portfolio to California Institute of the Arts, an art school that has a new animation program beginning this fall that you might want to be a part of. I had never heard of CalArts. I'd sworn I wouldn't go to school. I wrote for, to them for information. This is before, I'm telling you, this was before there was an internet. So you had to actually write and get an envelope with pieces of paper that had pictures of the school. Never saw the school, but I, it sounded interesting. This new program of character animation taught by Disney veterans. I thought, well, if I want to get into Disney, I think maybe I should go there for a year and see what happens. So I applied there, sent the same portfolio there, and I got accepted there. Of course, I had to make money to go there. It was expensive. So I worked that summer then to make money. And in a way, it was like I was starting over because it wasn't really a master's program. I think you're familiar with this, uh, that, uh, you know, going back to school after you've been out of school and your oh, relatives, yeah. in some case, thinking you're insane or at least or they think you're getting a master's degree or something. And I let them harbor that false hope because I knew I wasn't really. Um, so I went there that you're never having seen the school even. I mean, that's something that kids nowadays, at least, you know, middle class kids who, you know, tour kid places online at the very least. Never saw the school. So um, so I went there in September of 1975, and I was part of the first character animation class at CalArts, famous somewhat to some people, room A113, where we studied animation with Jack Hanna. And it was the first year of that program. And uh, so my classmates included John Lasseter and Brad Bird and Nancy Beeman and uh, Daryl Lance Hitters and uh, uh, Jerry Reese and Henry Selleck. And uh, so it was quite a good group to learn from. A lot of those people knew more about animation than I did. So during the course of my year there, I learned from them as much as I did from the teachers. Some of them had done animation and we critiqued each other's work. It was a very eye-opening, very collegial, very collaborative, a lot of fun, <clears throat> surrounded by creative people. And uh, at the end of that year, they surprised us by saying suddenly, hey, we're going to have the Disney Review Board come and look at the work, the student work, which you are like, what? And, and some people hadn't really done any animation. They had kind of sloughed off. They said, put your life drawings up on the wall. We did that. Put your design projects out in the courtyard. We did that. And then uh, they came and they saw our animation and they saw my animation and everybody else. We cut it together in a reel. And uh, it was the, it was the you know, it was Mark Davis. It was uh, Frank and Ollie. Bill Call wouldn't come to something like that. Don Bluth was there, I think, Willie Reitherman. Um, and much to my surprise, they liked my animation and they offered me a job at the Disney studio. And hey, it's easy, right? After Except, one you know, year? I, yeah, it was just I'd been there for a year. And uh, suddenly they offered me a job, not realizing I'm the person they rejected the year before. But me being the homebody that I was, it was hard for me to imagine, like, wait, I'm going to pull up stakes from Chicago, my big Irish Catholic family that I'm connected to. And I'm going to go live in a foreign place on my own, even though I've been at school for a year. But uh, I thought, well, I wonder... And they said, and they said, well, you know, you could just work as an intern this summer and then come back the next year. So I thought, actually, that sounds like it might be a good thing because then I could just spend a year getting used to the idea I'm going to be on my own and I could learn. I'm going to get to work that summer with Eric Larson, the great animator. He's going to teach me things, which in fact happened. He did. I went back to school. I used a lot of the things he told me. My animation improved in my mind, at least. I don't know if anybody else's. And so now flash forward to the end of that year. And once again, the Disney people are coming out. And I'm thinking, well, I should let them know that I'm done with my second year that I went back for. So I go down to the pay phone at the end of the hall. This is before cell phones, I tell you. And uh, put a you know, quarter in the machine and uh, call Disney. And they answered. And, and they're like, who is this calling? I said, you know, remember me, the guy that was here last summer? Six, who? You know, me, the guy. What? Did, you know, he offered the job. And, and uh, they didn't quite seem to. They, they, it jogged their memory barely. But they basically said, we didn't promise you anything. We'll see if we like you still or not. We don't know. You've got no guaranteed job here. And I was just like, what an idiot I have been. I just made the blunder of all time. I turned down a job, and now it's all to ruin. But uh, they came. They saw our work. 
they actually liked my work well enough to invite me once again to come work there. So this time I came and I was part of the first, in a way, wave out of that character animation program that came to Disney. So <clears throat> starting there, there were about five, I think there were five of us that came that first year out of the farm team, as it were. Henry Selleck, me, Jerry Reese, Brad Bird, and Doug Leffler, uh, who went to work at WDI for part of that time to work with Blaine Gibson, a sculptor. So now this was the introduction of, I mean, Glenn Keane had already been at the studio and he had been at Jules Engel's program at CalArts, but that's the film graphics program, it wasn't character animation. So we really were the vanguard of that wave that has since supplied many, many, many people to the Disney studio, countless people who have who've done all sorts of things, animators, directors, designers, layout people, background artists. Uh, it's just been a rich source of uh, talent for the studio. So that was in, so I started there in May of 1977. It was the week, I'm telling you, it was the week that uh, Star Wars came out in the United States. I don't know about Canada, but uh, I started on Monday and Star Wars came out on Wednesday. I didn't know anything about Star Wars, even though some people at CalArts had worked on the effects and things. Uh, uh, and all these people at the studio, the Disney, were buzzing about like, oh, we're going to go see it. And I'm like, you mean you're taking off work during the day to go see a movie? What what kind of a job is this that you can do that? Okay. But uh, so people got up in line. But I didn't do it Wednesday when it opened. Other hardcore people did. I was like, I don't know if you can leave work. And I've just started. And I went, what? I don't. But then other people were going again on Friday. And so I I think at lunchtime, or sure, maybe we left early at the end of Friday. So I went and saw Star Wars that first week. With a you know a million other people, actually it was only in a few theaters. The way they used to release the way they used to release films, I'm telling you, it was just it was only in a couple of theaters, and then it built up lines, and then gradually they rolled it out to more theaters. But for a while, it was just in Westwood and the Chinese theater. So I saw that the Chinese down, and it was it was exhilarating. You know, I mean, the audience went cuckoo for it. People saw George Lucas and the Hamburger Hamlet across the street. You know, taken in the lines and the whole deal, and it was just wow, what an experience. So that was sort of my introduction to Disney. It was coupled with this crazy, ironic, you know, Lucas experience, which in the light of them buying Lucas, uh, it all fits together somehow, doesn't it? But uh, what, was, what so, was the first role you were uh, doing at Disney? So the first thing we, um, we were doing, we did pencil tests there. <laughs> I know you had a later question about failures, but I could still talk about failures for a while because uh, the deal was when you came to Disney, you did like uh, eight weeks of personal tests under the supervision of Eric Larson, two four-week tests. After the first four weeks, you did a test. If they liked, it went before the review board. If they liked your animation, you got picked up for another four weeks. If they liked you at the end of that four weeks, then you moved into the, as I call it, the general prison population. But you sort of became an employee of the studio and you were put to work in theory on production or something, you know, perhaps as an in-betweener or wherever you might fit in or what they, wherever they needed help. So I did my initial four-week test and uh, I did... I was over ambitious. I tried to do too many things. And even now I'm doing my own film. We'll get into that later. But of course I did some animation that I didn't particularly tie down. I batted it out, all this stuff. So it was shown to the review board at the end of my four weeks. And I'm thinking, and once again, you know, I think, you know, it could be better, but it's okay, I guess. And then I, Eric Larson came back with a very somber face after the review board. I'm not there when they're looking at it. They're looking at it off in a sweat box. And oh boy. <laughs> Not good. Uh, various people didn't like my animation. They said, maybe he wants to do story because obviously he's not interested in animation. And I'm like, no, no, I am interested in animation. What did they not like? I think they felt that I had, you know, it was too rushed. It wasn't tied down. It wasn't committed. It, the acting was kind of vague. Uh, any number of things. So Eric was very great, patient, gentle, avuncular mentor. And he just said, Okay, we're going to slow down. We're going to slow down. We're going to try and you know concentrate more on this and do less and do it better and da da da. So I embarked on a new test that was still probably too long, but much shorter than the old one. So it's just a few shots, a pencil animation, no track. Neither of these had any sort of track. Just a bit of pantomime acting. I came up with a little scenario, and uh, I had a, a kid serving a big guy a drink, and the big guy was a big Stromboli-esque sort of big villain type guy with a beard and a mustache and kind of broader animation the kid was a little serving kid kind of you know like a wart or something but i mean kind of like a 10 year old kid um anyway that it fared much better and they really liked that test so i got to move on and so thank goodness so oh, good, it was yeah. like so eric said hey you know it's, and so and even i was very excited because frank and ollie came and sought me out after the test because the big the big heavy guy and particularly they liked and and Frank, you know, Frank has a reputation uh, 
did then and still now, although he's, he's since passed on, but uh, one of his nicknames was the Velvet Needle because, you know, he could say something nice, but he could also kind of, you know, say something very sharp and pointed that might be accurate, but it was like, oh, so he, he sort of gave me one of those a little bit because he, he basically really liked the big guy in the test, which was what I was more interested in doing. And it was he liked it. He said, yeah, the kid, you know, that kid, he's kind of flimsy. He's flimsy. And it was true. He was flimsy. It was a- absolutely accurate. But having Frank and Ollie say they liked your animation, I mean, I was on cloud nine. So I, I was like, ah, after having seemingly been kicked out of the studio once I got there, I had the endorsement of these guys. So that was great. So then um, the thing that was going at that time, there was a Christmas featurette called The Small One about the donkey that carries Jesus, uh, carries Mary to the manger and then where she gives birth and all that. And a Christmas story had been developed possibly as sort of a training film, a featurette that young animators could train on then to move on to feature films, including the long-awaited Black Cauldron, this dark, epic fantasy that everyone was like, oh, that's going to be this generation Snow White. It's just going to be, it's it's got these fantasy elements, it's got magic, it's got production values, it's got rich backgrounds, it's got effects, it's got opportunity, it's got great rich characters in these novels by Lloyd Alexander. It's a really great property. And Mel Shaw, a veteran from Disney who had, he had worked on uh, Bambi and other things. He was a sketch artist. He did these amazing pastels for many, many projects, but certainly for the Black Cauldron that got many people excited. They're up in the hall. You never use spray fixative. God help you. You bump in one of those drawings. You could you could erase you know a month's worth of work, and uh, it was frightening because it was right in our hallway there, and it's a narrow hallway. Um, so anyway, uh, but the trick was, uh, as it constituted originally, and again, I, I, this is probably way too much detail for you. I'm sorry, Terry, but I'll, I'll give you a little <laughs> bit more. Um, the small one was a featurette that was going to be directed by Eric Larson, you know, because he was in charge of all the trainees and he was our great mentor. And he had Glenn Keane doing these cartoony character designs, which we all love very <clears throat> kind of in the style of the flying gauchito. Well, what happened was like, we came in, so I was on it for maybe a week as a possible, you know, a young animator on it when there was like, it seemed like a palace coup, but we came in at one weekend and suddenly Glenn Keane's drawings of this kid were off the walls. The model sheets were gone. New model sheets were put up that had been drawn by somebody else, John Pomeroy, in fact, and Don Bluth. And uh, and Don Bluth was now directing the short, and Eric was out. He was not doing it anymore. We felt like someone, Eric, just got, had a mafia hit performed on him. This was not a willing thing that, you know, he was told, stand down, step away, we're going to have Don Bluth do this. I think Don Bluth at that time was thought of like, He's going to be the guiding light for the younger generation. He was older than most people there. He was, even then, he was about 40, but he was thought of as among the young people, like the leader of the young people, the future director, the guy who would shape the films, and he would take this over. It's a little murky whose decision it was for this coup to happen, but happen it did. And those of us like Brad Bird and me and Jerry were kind of devastated because Eric Larson, we were so looked forward to working with him and learning from him. That started a year-long working on the film, which was not a happy experience for me because I just creatively was not in sync with Don Bluth. And, you know, the things that he liked, I don't think I liked. And the things, you know, the character designs he liked <clears throat> didn't appeal to me. His sense of filmmaking, sense of acting, all the way up and down the line, what I liked didn't quite line up with him. I got to work, though, with Cliff Nordberg, who was a veteran animator, who was a cartoony animator, broad animator. They saw my animation. They knew... This guy's like a cartoony guy. I haven't worked with Cliff, who's a cartoony guy, because he could never do the more realistic kind of straighter characters, which was true. I would be better at the cartoony characters. Um, so I worked with Cliff, and he was a great guy to work with. So I spent a year kind of working with Cliff. He was in the Kimball unit back in the day, so he did great animation on with Ward Kimball on things like the Mad Tea Party and stuff like that. Really fun, but he totally the opposite end of Frank and Ollie. And so from in some quarters... Cliff was looked down on because he worked very broadly. He worked very loosely and he worked very intuitively. He didn't, he wasn't analytical. <clears throat> he would really like act out the scenes and just kind of feel it and draw it. And he didn't agonize over the dark night of the soul of the character and his inner motivation. He's like, well, he's going to walk down here and he's going to bounce around on here and then he's going to turn around over here. And it was very straightforward, you know, just he felt it and he drew what he felt. So it was a great, it was great to learn from him. And I really was lucky for the time I spent with him. So I worked with him, uh, small one, the fractures got deeper. It was almost like a civil war at the studio. The Bluth people were eager to do their own film, and which they were working on in their own time. You know, Don had banjoed the woodpile cat, his own sort of 
separate project he was working on in the evenings, running himself ragged while he was during the day he was having to do Peach Dragon or Small One or that sort of thing. Uh, with the goal, I think, ultimately, that I think he really did want to leave and start his own studio, which is what he did. And there was a big walkout in 1979 when he took about a dozen people with him to start his studio. The studio management was very shook because here were 12 good animators that walked out with Don. And, and you know, they, we were working on The Fox and the Hound at that time, which I was an animator on. I moved from small one to becoming an animator on The Fox and the Hound. When Don and his group left, it actually afforded some of us more opportunities to do some animation that his group was doing that they were gone now. So in some ways it benefited me. I did scenes of the hunter on that film. I had been working on Dinky and Boomy, Boomer, those those deathless classic characters that you've never heard of. But uh, And Squeaks, the, the, the worm. You've got to remember Squeaks. No, you, if you do, I'm, no one does. But uh, So I was doing these kind of cartoony uh, bird, woodpecker, and sparrow. Jerry Reese did these amazing scenes of this sparrow where he used real sparrow flitty behavior to do these little wing twitches that were amazing and brilliant and wonderful and very animation-friendly. Um, so anyway, I wanted to be an animator on Fox and for a couple of years and turmoil continued during that time a little bit because, uh, even after the Bluth people left, the younger generation wasn't quite being given its voice. It seemed like, and so there was conflict between them and kind of some of the middle managers who were running the animation department who finally got to do something after the night old men had to kind of back away. Some of the people that maybe had been held down for a time now they were put in charge, but they didn't to some of us from college didn't seem like they had the creative instincts of, didn't seem like they were going to make, you know, films like Pinocchio or Snow White or something. It seemed like they weren't headed in that direction. So there was still a certain amount of turmoil. And, and Fox and Hound was not a film that I would say a lot of the younger generation embraced all that much just as a film. It didn't engage people's interest. It didn't have fantasy, not a lot of comedy, whatever. It just didn't quite connect. Um, so there was still a situation at Disney where there was a schism between some of the younger people who had come from CalArts and other people who had been at the studio for a while. Into that mix steps a guy named Tom Wilhite. Tom Wilhite was a live action executive. He was only a few years older than I was, but he had made a name for himself in publicity and they were looking for someone to help move their live action department into the rest of the industry. Disney was so much like they were doing like, you know, Gus the Kicking Mule and uh, the Apple Dumpling Gang movies, but they weren't making Star Wars and they weren't doing Black Stallion and they weren't doing... E.T. And they weren't doing these other films and Raiders of the Lost Ark. They weren't doing films that Spielberg and Lucas were making that ostensibly were family films, but they were making these kind of, you know, kind of not so great family lowbrow sort of comedies. So into that steps Tom Wilhite, this sort of wunderkind of sorts, who got to know some of the younger talent on the animation side, like Tim Burton, like John Lester, like me, like other people. And he became sort of an advocate for us with Ron Miller, who was running the studio at the time. Ron Miller married Walt Disney's daughter, Diane. He, ran, he was running the studio then. And he was a nice guy and he was a, a good guy, but he was not uh, a filmmaker, uh, you know, like a, a director, a visionary, like a Spielberg or somebody like that. So, um, so Tom, he was looking for someone, someone to help him rekindle, you know, the live action. So Tom was that, he anointed that person. And in, in in the course of that, Tom was trying to get animation, you know, CalArts people and other people empowered in animation. So he, he enabled Tim Burton to do a short Vincent. He sort of found money. He disguised it somehow in the system and found some money to pay Tim to do his short. And he basically engineered it. So he said, I think they need a younger director in the ranks with these veteran guys. And he sort of canvassed people. And out of that canvassing, somehow... I got put forward by other people, not me. I didn't put myself forward. Suddenly they sort of yanked me out of a room and said, we, you know, we're interested in you being a director. And I had never really thought about being a director, except I had directed my own live action films in high school and college. I made live action shorts with my friend. And I made a feature in live action, which took us like three or four years to do, which I wrote. And we shot with a Super 8 camera, all that kind of stuff. And I was kind of writing and directing it, but I, I just thought I was making the movie. I didn't think of job titles or anything. And even being at Disney at that time, everybody wanted to be a directing animator. They wanted to be Milt Call. They wanted to be Frank Thomas. They wanted to be Ward Kimball. They wanted to be someone who, you know, was a performer. And that's what I wanted to do, too. So the idea of being a director, in some ways, many people didn't want that job at that time. They went, no, no, I want to be an animator. So I sort of, I know it sounds like, how can this be true? But I sort of felt like, well, I'll take one for the team and become <laughs> a director so that... Uh, 
I can empower the people I know, support their ideas through the system and get this going, as well as my own, my own too, certainly, but that I could be a, you know, a conduit for their voice. So that's all. Initially, I had almost turned down the job where I was kind of, you know, like that. And, and then I went back and I realized, that's not a good answer. You know, when they, do you want to direct? You're like, uh, and it's like, that is not the answer you want to hear. So I went back to Ron Miller a few days after having given him that answer. I said, I've thought it over. You know what? I think I really would like to direct. He's like, okay. So they put me <clears throat> as a director on the Black Cauldron, kind of the, uh, they put me with three other directors, these sort of uh, somewhat veteran directors who had done Fox and the Hound. And I was put with them. And basically, we were like oil and water. I mean, the character designs I liked, they didn't like. The story ideas I liked, they didn't like. The character, the, you name it. I mean, it's just the sensibility was totally different. Um, Tom Wilhite had had a producer put on Black Cauldron, Joe Hale, who was a veteran guy, but who seemed open to new ideas. So he thought by putting Joe Hale in charge of all those directors, putting me in as a director, he would get enough veteran leadership that Ron Miller wouldn't be spooked by it. And and there would be a, a you know some kind of a symbiosis between the veterans and the new people, that didn't happen unfortunately, and uh, it was people were at loggerheads, and so uh, such so, so that I was really ready to quit. I was just so out of sync with the other people. I, I kept storyboarding sequences for Black Cauldron. I storyboarded things based on the book and based on some early writings on the film that I liked that I thought was kind of character and comedy driven and emotion driven. But the other directors didn't like it at all. They just thought it, there was nothing there. So it was very discouraging. Um, they got word that I was unhappy. So then they decided we need a life raft for some of these unhappy people. So they, they uh, Ron Clements had independently proposed a book, Basil of Baker Street, Street, which is a Mount Sherlock Holmes. It's a book by Eve Titus. He liked the book. He thought it might be a good animated film to do this sort of Mount Sherlock Holmes. So he had pitched it to Joe Hale, the producer of, Black Cauldron, Joe read the book and he said, I think this is good. And he talked Ron Miller into optioning the book. So when we were having trouble, not just me, but the other Ron who was doing story at that point and some of the other story people, they took a, about four or five of us malcontents and they said, okay, you're going to work on Basil of Baker Street. Forget it. You're not working on Cauldron. You're rowing in a different direction. We need unity here and you'll be happier. They'll be happier. We're going forward like this. So I was put in charge of directing Basil of Baker Street. Still not having really directed anything because all my storyboards went for naught. You know, I was in some audition sessions with some of the actors that was interesting to observe and to be a part of. But, you know, my boards never got off the ground. They were never shot or anything like that. So I became the, the sole director at that point of Basil of Baker Street. So I was developing it as I thought might be fun, which was to say I was taking it in a slightly wacky direction, which was not necessarily embraced by Ron Miller. I was somewhat influenced by my own sense of humor and things that appeal to me like Monty Python, you know, which, I, and the goon show, which preceded that, this radio show that Peter Sellers was on. It was very sort of cerebral and funny. And, uh, and so we proceeded to develop a version of Basil that I would say, push the envelope a little bit in terms of tone that was a little bit more self-aware. Uh, the Basil in our version was sort of based on John Cleese somewhat. He was really antisocial and kind of humorously. So kind of pre faulty towers, Faulty Towers a little bit, uh, if you know that show. Anyway, we worked on that for about six months. We boarded a whole, the whole opening, you know, a bunch of sequences. It was myself, Joe Ramp. Got to work with Joe Ramp and all that great guy, brilliant talent, who was a few years behind me at school. Anyway, we showed that to Ron Miller, finally, the storyboards. He did not like it. He did not care for it. It was not what he was thinking. He was thinking he was going to have this cute little mouse Sherlock Holmes, and he had this kind of edgier and... Uh, humor that he didn't really <laughs> line up with. You know, I don't, I don't know that Ron and Monty Python necessarily were ever in the room with each other. Um, so basically, here we were again. Here I, and they said, he kind of said, start over. I, I It's got to have, where's the warmth? Where's the heart? Disney has heart. There's no warmth in this. That was a legitimate point. In my zeal to try and get humor, uh, heart was down ways on the equation. It was in there a little bit, but not a whole lot. There was a little bit. Um, so into that void stepped a guy named Vance Gary, great story man, layout man, who was, who was a veteran. He was one of the guys from the sort of in-between generation. He wasn't as old as the Nine Old Men, but he wasn't our age either. He, so he was my senior by 30 years. Um, great story artist. And so he started developing this uh, warmer version of Basil. Bernie Mattinson also got involved. He helped push it that way. Um, 
Pete Young, a story man who died before his time, also helped. So all these people helped get it in in a direction that Ron Miller liked better. And I found my way back in, in a way, because I was sort of still pushing some things that I found in the novel. You know, the basic thing that Sherlock Holmes was kind of an antisocial guy. I mean, that's what they used in the Benedict Cumberbatch version. And, that, and he was a manic depressive. And there was comedy to be had in that. And you could still get hard. He could develop this unlikely friendship with Dawson, where he he isn't being very nice to him yet, he really likes him and all that, and uh, and there could be a case brought to him that tugs at your heartstrings, but he's insensitive too. You can get comedy mileage out of that, and you can still get the heartstrings of you really care about this uh, poor little girl who brings this case to him. Anyway, so I, I sort of found I brought a little bit of the tartness of my version into that version, and they brought more heart and warmth, and and we sort of met in the middle somewhere. So that's how it played out. Only. Again, jump in here, Terry. But um, <laughs> the uh, the studio went through a major overhaul in the middle of that because uh, there was a financier named Saul Steinberg who was buying up Disney stock, which was very low at the time in the mid '80s because movies hadn't been doing that well. So the stock was way undervalued. So he was doing green mail, as they call it. He was buying up stock to get a controlling interest in the company only to sell it off and make a lot of money. He was going to break it into pieces, sell the parks to some person, sell the film studio to somebody else, sell the characters, to, you know, split it up, and he could make the most money that way. Well, that was a horrible prospect. I mean, Disney, as it, has come, as it was known and as it would be known, would somewhat cease to exist were that to happen. Fortunately, into that void or into that problem stepped Roy Disney, who had left the company in a dispute with Ron Miller, where he... Roy Disney Jr., who was the son of Roy Disney Sr., the business head of Disney, um, you know, I don't think he liked the way Ron Miller was running the studio, so he left. Now the studio is really foundering because the stock is so low and this guy's buying up stock. Roy and his partner, Stanley Gold, line up investors, the Brass Brothers from Texas, who are silver barons, and they buy up enough stock, and they buy out Saul Steinberg in some fashion, they make him go away. But now, and they make Ron Miller go away. They say, okay, Roy's in, Ron, you're out. We need someone to run the studio. They tap Michael Eisner from Paramount. Michael brings Jeffrey. And in that, so this is now in 1984, and now the whole studio changes again. And so the guy who was our boss, and in fact was the producer of Basil of Baker Street, Ron Miller, we, we almost felt like we were the kids who were in a classroom where our teacher was killed in a car accident. We're the only person that knows that. You know, we're in a class with no teacher, and but people in the rest of the school don't realize it. And it's like, it's like Lord of the Flies or something. It's like, do we tell people that we don't have a producer on our movie anymore, that Ron Miller is the producer and he's gone? And, you know, a few weeks went by. Well, Roy Disney met with us and we pitched him the project. He liked the project, but we had to pitch it to Michael and Jeffrey, even though he'd been working on it for three years in slow motion. Oh and they God. might decide to throw the whole thing out because, you know, if they don't like it, hey, that's the way it works with new management. Fortunately, they liked it well enough, although they said you have to do it in, with half as much money and in half the amount of time. To which Bernie said, okay, we'll do it. And Roy Disney, who knew Bernie from years at the studio in different capacities, said, Bernie, you're really going to run this project. And Bernie and I had been kind of co-equals to that point uh, when Bernie became kind of a co-director with me. But now he said, no, Bernie, you're going to produce the movie. I would be a director on it. And Bernie, you can keep directing, but you're the, you're the overall producer now. So that happened in, uh, I think, early 1985 or something like that. So Bernie was the producer of it. And... Uh, and that opened up an opportunity for Ron Clements because Bernie had been directing some sequences that he no longer had time to do. And Ron, who had been chafing at a chance to direct, went to Bernie and said, you know, I, would, I really would like to be a director. And Bernie said, yeah, well, take over the sequences I was doing. I'll do that. And so Ron picked up those sequences. And that's where he sort of first became a director. And it was all sort of this series of dominoes that had fallen. This is, I, <laughs> I, I mean, this is, Fantastic. I have read all about this stuff, but to hear it firsthand is, is, uh, uh, yeah, just, Please, I, I feel uh, like you, you need to document this somehow, I, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I don't know if I can talk about it yet, but Ron, it, well, I, this is a podcast. I shouldn't say anything, but anyway, there will be some <laughs> documentation of this. It, it will be forthcoming. Yes. Uh, not from me necessarily, but other, other people will be documenting it. And yeah, it should, it should be, it is part of the history. I think we've done oral histories within the studio, you know, where they yeah. get us in and we, Talk in front of the camera, but this detailed uh, thing of what went on down this, I don't think that really is out there. No, so uh, no, this is, I, I mean, well, I've, bits I've... of it are. You know, it's weird because I did an interview a number of years ago, and now it's just come out. Uh, Bill Croyer did a book that just came out, Director's Perspectives, and mm. 
there's a bunch of directors. There's two volumes. I know Tom Moore was interviewed and Tom Cito and Ron and Don Bluth and other people about their project. Brad Bird, John Laster. It's a, it might be a good series, but I think I talk, talked to, I can't remember what I said two years ago, but I think I probably talked about the, some of the same stuff. But anyway, so that's, that's how it evolved. And now suddenly we're in a new universe with Michael and Jeffrey and everything is different and they're very much, it's no longer a country club and we'll put the movie out when we feel like it. No, no, no. It's got a budget. It's got a deadline. Faster, cheaper, better becomes the mantra. You know, they 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 didn't just say, you know, bat it out and we'll send it overseas. Although there were some people that they had brought in with them from Paramount who said, that's what you should do because it's costing you too much money to make these movies. And the Care Bears movie had come out uh, when Black Cauldron came out and it cost a fraction of it and it made more money than Black Cauldron. So there were some people, bottom line people who said, that's what you should do. Send it overseas, ship it, animate it there, bat it out, try and get some return on your investment. You're never going to make a dime the way they're doing it right now. Fortunately, Michael and Jeffrey, even if they thought maybe he's right, they still said, well, I think, I think Michael really didn't want to be the person to shut Disney animation down. So I think they sort of felt like, let's see if we can make this thing work. And saw it in Jeffrey. It was like a challenge thrown in front of him. He was like, you know, a bull with a red flag in front of him. Make this work, make it, make the movies better and make them make money. Okay. Yes, sir. You know? And so, uh, so off he went to do that, and he was a very smart guy, and and he put his, all his energies into it, along with doing live action. It wasn't like his sole focus. He was still, day to day, most of his energies was put into live action. But we would see him about once a week when we were working then on Little Mermaid, maybe, and we would be showing him things. And he certainly would weigh in on, you know, every every last bit of the production, you know, to excessive effect. I mean, even when we were doing the score for... Uh, Great Mouse Detective, you know, and they were in by this time, and uh, Henry Mancini was doing the score for it. And so uh, we were joking about it with Mancini because he had met with them, and, and Jeffrey wasn't necessarily a fan of Henry Mancini. In fact, at one point, I think he had Chris Montan, one of his lieutenants, he said, you have to go to Henry Mancini and fire Henry Mancini, at least from writing this one song. And here's Chris Montan. I'm going to go to this veteran of the industry, and I'm going to fire him. He didn't exactly fire him, but he did uh, had a song redone by somebody else. He took a song away from him. But... Uh, I remember talking to Henry Mancini about and joking with him, saying, yeah, Jeffrey, you know, he's known for being hands-on. And uh, Henry Mancini said, hands-on, elbows, the whole arm, it was, uh, which was true. I mean, Jeffrey was very invasive and very, he had, it was pretty unrestrained, but fortunately, he had live action, you know, five days a week to keep him busy. So we were kind of, you know, that couple of hours here and there that he crammed in, but his main his main focus was live action, which I think suited in some ways, kept him fresher and more objective when we showed him things. He wasn't in the trenches so much as he was even later when he was running DreamWorks and he was there every day, 24 seven here, he would just drop in. And I think it kept his eye a little sharper by being in that role. So the gray mouse detective wraps up and then, uh, yeah, that? it wraps up. I'll tell you a funny <laughs> story. So we got good reviews and, uh, and before the movie came out, Jeffrey called to congratulate us because the reviews were coming back and they were really good. And, uh, he, he, you know, it's the, the usual thing he did with filmmakers on the advance of a movie coming out. If it got good reviews, he would call up. It's, he was very detail-oriented about that sort of thing. So I remember I asked him, I said, Jeffrey, how, how much money do you think, you know, the movie's going to make? And Jeffrey, classic, great thing that I still remember. Because Jeffrey, God, he, he probably knew what the tracking was that wasn't tracking very well and 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 all that. But so he said to me, you know what? They'd have to carry me out of here on a stretcher if I told you how much money that the movie's going to make. That was his way of avoiding the question entirely and not putting any sort of dollar amount to it. As it turned out, it just it did just so so. It didn't do all that great, and which bothered Jeffrey because it had you know the reviews were good, and he was he got into a mode there even for a while where he was starting to contemplate. You know, maybe we got to raise the prices on these movies because kids movies, we don't make as much money because they're kids movies. So in order to make these profitable, we may have to consider alternative pricing and all this. And uh, that never happened. But uh, but he still didn't see it's like somehow I want to make this animation enterprise. I want to make it financially successful. He wasn't really worried about winning awards at that point. He was just like he wanted to make money and he wanted, he wanted to make good films, but he wanted to make money. both. So so he did various things that he thought would help him in that regard. 
Amazing. And well, I've I've seen The Great Most Detective probably like five or six times. We had it oh, yeah. on home video when I was a kid. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're um, the age where yeah, you might have caught it as a kid. Yeah, it was a it, um, it was a fun movie. A lot of people still cite it today, and it was a, it was a fun. There were some scary parts of, in that too. Non in the movie, you know, his sensibility and and some of me in there too, and and Bernie as well. Bernie was Bernie's idea, which he he borrowed a bit, but it was still his idea to borrow it. Uh, you know, the whole uh, the way. Radigan was played in it. Originally, I was a little down on, well, if Radigan's just going to be a standard issue villain, that doesn't seem very interesting to me. And then Bernie said, uh, and I think Ron had the idea of if he's a rat, but he's sensitive about being a rat and he doesn't like to be called a rat. I think that was Ron's idea, which was fun. And then it was Glenn Keane who had the idea, let's draw him like Ron Miller, our boss, who looked was a big, imposing guy, but looked great in a suit. So he drew uh, Radigan and all these, you know, nice tailored suits and all that. It, part of his affectation to disguise the fact that he was a rat. But uh, Bernie had seen a movie, a, a very cheesy kind of B movie called Champagne for Caesar that had Vincent Price doing the villain in that movie. It was a movie about a game show contestant played by Ronald Coleman, who was very dry and British and, you know, he's Ronald Coleman and all this. And Vincent Price is totally over the top, manic, maniac, competing against him. He went, there, there was no ceiling to his performance. He was just uh, way over the top, but hilarious. So I haven't seen it in years. I think it would hold up, but he was just so kooky. And so Bernie thought, have Vincent Price, but don't have him underplay you know, villain or he's not going to do a tight you know, little hammer villain or anything like that. Have him do like Champagne for Caesar, go kind of nuts. He's volatile. He really goes from one extreme to the other. And that was great. So that's what we wrote toward, and that's what we directed Vince toward. And he loved it. He loved being, and he had loved making that movie. So he had a, a ton of fun doing it, and we did too, making it. It was a challenge to make because, you know, we had to do it on budget, on time, and all that stuff. And, you know, and it, there were various sort of production values that had to be cut, you know, or just sort of barreled through in order to get the movie made. But uh, there was an energy. I mean, it was a marked contrast. And, in fact, they moved us out of the building. That was the big deal, you know, because they – they. Uh, they wanted to use the live act, the animation building to get live action production companies right there with them to regenerate live action. So they thought we're just going to kick animation out into warehouses in Glendale. So that's what they did. So in, when we were working on Basil, suddenly like in the rain, we moved to a leaky drafty warehouse that was still being repurposed. So we're in there and, you know, there were literally, it was like termite terrace. They're working on the building and, you know, bugs and soot is coming out of the ceiling and asbestos probably while we're trying to make Basil at Baker Street. And it was very much a sink or swim mentality because it felt like we, animation was in this beautiful building on the lot. It's animation. It's Disney animation. It's part of the crown jewel. No, no, no. We're in an industrial park in Glendale, and, you know, it's an unmarked building, and, you know, it's got cinder block walls, and it's got no campus-like atmosphere, and uh, it's – and you better, you know, do it on time and on money and hopefully make something people like. So that was the spirit under which it was made. Despite that, much esprit de corps, perhaps because of it, because there was like, we were in this together and it's our, our fate is in our hands to a certain extent. Uh, and we'll just try and make the best movie we can. So that's that's the atmosphere it was done under. And then as it rolled from that into other projects, yeah. Little Mermaid, Lion King, they were still made someone in those fa in those warehouses over there, you know, with the... Uh, the kind of less than advantageous working conditions. And our big thing at that time was we want to be back on the lot. We want to be in an animation building of our own. And when Beauty and the Beast was a big hit, Michael Eisner had a, you know, there was a, a toast, I think, celebrating the movie. And he announced at the thing, yes, we are going to build you a new animation building. <laughs> big oh cheer. Goodness. Everybody was happy. Uh, well, we were happy. But I, I think there were tensions because between Roy and Michael, who's going to announce it? And things were starting to, starting the glimmers of uh, trouble in paradise where, you know, so the only thing that uh, the thing that can most breed failure is success. And we were starting to have success, you know, and so then who gets credit for that success? And, you know, and, and it started seeds of uh, later problems were sown, but it was, but each movie, you know, was sort of building on the audiences of the previous one and expanding and doing better. Oliver and company, we did better than Oliver and company when we made little mermaid. And then, coming after us well, rescuers down under came after us didn't do so well but then after that you know uh uh beauty and the beast came out did better than we did and then Lad did better than they did lion king did better than Lad. and so it was very much a you know yeah. building on the shoulders of the previous films both creatively <clears throat> technologically and uh 
breaking through the audience because there still was this there's always had been a stigma you know animation is only a children's film it's only for kids and we were fighting that throughout our tenure and it still happens today you know is animation a medium that's only for children and can an adult find something to like well the classic Disney films, among other things, when I saw them, when I was thinking about getting back into animation, when I was, you know, 20, 21, I, I looked at Cinderella and I was like, this is great. This is so entertaining and so involving and so compelling. And uh, these people are brilliant that made this. And I felt as adult, I didn't feel like I was being talked down to, you know. And so and that was Disney's mantra. I know Walt Disney himself. I had read story notes from Walt uh, during the making of Bambi, where there was an in-house screening. And someone on the in-house notes said, well, I think the kids will like it. And Walt was very insulted by that, very offended. In the transcript, I was like, well, you know, like, what the hell is that crack? You know, sort of like, right. yeah, uh, you know, I'm not making these movies for kids. You know, I'm making them for a general audience. It includes kids, but it is not, it has never been aimed at children. I've never thought I was, you know, aiming these at children to the exclusion of adults. Um, I'm loving all the, the little details that you have about all these films and the making of and everything. I'm actually wondering... Um, you mentioned The Little Mermaid and Aladdin and stuff like that and yeah. how you were building on the audience and kind of the success of that. Can you can you kind of is there stuff that you learned along the way with writing and, and working on these films that by the by the time you went to Moana, I guess, which is one of your most recent um, right. projects that you were like, OK, this is what I learned over the years and we're going to make sure we do it this way. Well, it's weird. Now, you would think that, wouldn't you? <laughs> but, <laughs> I, know, I, I would say. Um, each film was a little different. I mean, they all have the similar things in that the story in many ways is the most crucial part and the hardest part to make work. And some of these stories were straighter through from conception to the screen. Some had huge zigzags and slaloms and found their way there. Um, certainly over the course of the films, learning to be critical of your own work, you know, film after film, trying to maintain your objectivity, the, uh, it's so important to do that and yet hold on to things that you think are strong because the, the ideas are going to have to survive, you know, for a few years of getting beaten up and, and it's got to be a pretty strong idea to do that. Um, are there I moments know that there's uh, like encapsulate certain lessons like this? We learned this. I mean, we, uh, I, I would say you learn about communicating. I mean, I think as the films went on, I think, you know, as I can look back and I see films, the early films where, I feel like, oh, yeah, we could have communicated a certain idea better. We we cut away too quickly. I would say that's one of my problems, even still today as I'm working on my own short film, is like allowing the audience enough time to not only register something, but to feel it. You know, it's important for all these films. I think you you don't, you you can't just, I know the story on an intellectual level. I know the plot. I understand the plot. I know what's going on. You have to feel the story, I would say. And that's something that maybe emerged over the course of the films. You have to feel both the characters and the story. You have to be engaged in them. And you have to, uh, so it's a weird delicate, uh, weird balancing act because you, you try to uh, surprise people and yet not make something come out of left field. So that's always this ongoing tricky thing. Uh, the, the best endings are always those that are surprising and yet they can't be anything but the ending that you've got. How do you find an ending that sort of uh, surprises people and yet delivers on what you've set up in a satisfying way? So that's always a, a knife edge thing on all these films that you're trying to do. Um, the importance, one of the things over the course of the films that I'm still working on, it's a very slippery notion, but it's a word that got bandied about at Disney a lot when I was first there. And I, it can get, I'd say, misused and... Uh, but there's a word appeal. And I think they felt like Disney films had appeal. And in some ways, that's what Ron Miller was talking about, even on Basil. What you guys are doing doesn't have appeal. But appeal can mean different things, and it can be manifest in many different ways. And it's sort of like one of those things, it's like charisma or something like that. You know, It's like hard to define, but if somebody's got it, there's something that makes you engage with them. And it can be a story can have appeal, a character can have appeal, a world can have appeal. Conversely, a story can lack appeal. A character can lack appeal. And uh, uh, if they do, you may be in trouble because there's some inherent things that just keep the audience at a remove. I think I'm, I'm going to mix my metaphors all over the place here. One metaphor I heard, which I liked, which I grew to understand a little bit more, Joe Hale, our producer on The Black Cauldron, said 
I think of these movies as tree houses. We're building tree house for people. Now I built a tree house right out there. If I could turn the camera on, you could see, except it's nighttime here, but um, tree houses are kind of, I always liked tree houses growing up. Although I grew up in a subdivision in Chicago where the trees were, the trunks were two inches wide. They had newly planted trees. I never saw a tree house, but the romance of having a tree house, of having your own world within another world, you climb up in a tree house, you see the world from a different point of view. It's fun. You know, there's an element of adventure and fun about it. And, uh, and this different perspective, uh, all those things I think do apply to animated films. That's what you're inviting people to sort of join in that fun adventure that a treehouse is. Uh, I think that is true. Um, it, uh, another analogy of stories and all that is every movie is sort of, it's kind of, you're, you're, you're creating a train. <laughs> the story is kind of a train, the movie is a train. You gotta get people to get on the train. If they either don't get on the train or they get on and then they get off again, <laughs> you got to get them back on the train. And you may not be able to get them back on the train because the train is leaving. They're having lunch. They're, they don't see it. It's starting to pull out of the station. And the train is moving very fast. And if they happen to get off the train, very likely they ain't getting back on. That's the way a lot of these movies work, where the opening you know, of the movie, if through the first 20 minutes, and Jeffrey was like this a little bit. In a way, this is what Jeffrey was trying to do is, Guys, because when we showed him our first version of Basil of Baker Street, we showed it to him in story real fashion. We were 10 minutes into it, something like that. Wait, stop, stop, stop the projector. Stop. Whoa, hey, hey. You know, blew, the whistle stopped. I don't know who I'm supposed to care about. I don't know what's going on. Well, I'm not following what's happening. There's nothing compelling. Da, 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 da. And we had you know another 40 minutes to show. He said, I'm not even going to look at that 40 minutes until you give me 10 minutes that makes me want to watch the rest of the 40 minutes. So yes. I was just kind of in shock when I heard that. But Bernie Mattinson, to his credits, said, well, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So that was literally what he said. So he, we went about restructuring the story. We put a teaser up front. We changed the order of the way the narrative was working. And we tried to get uh, a catchier sort of opening. And we did. We showed it to Jeffrey. He liked it. And he stayed through the rest of it. Um, there can be any number of things that you do clarity wise, uh, entertainment wise, appeal wise that can leave the audience at the station. And if you leave them at the station, no matter what you do later, it's possible you cannot get them back on the train, no matter how much you do those other things. So, but it can be different things in different movies, you know, and, and, uh, but I think it's crucial to get people to invest emotionally in the story and in the characters. That's the heart of these things. You want, and if the world can be something that, I mean, one of the things we realized we stumbled into, and Ron has mentioned, I think in a lot of our movies, we had something familiar, but we had something new. It was sort of a marriage of those two things. Now, if you do a movie that's all familiar, that can be boring, and the audience can feel like they're ahead of it and they're not experiencing something. If you do a movie that's all completely new, that can be just sort of I can't keep up with it, and I'm I'm just sort of lost, and I'm and I it's too much of a shock, and da da da. But if you can blend those ideas and have something, and in a way, a fairy tale in itself, some familiar fairy tales give you a construct that, by its nature, to a certain extent, is something old or traditional or whatever. But then, if you find a way to tell that fairy tale in a way that is unique and people don't see coming, or you, the way you play a certain character, or the way you play out the story. Um, I think there's an exhilaration to that so that you you have the comfort of familiar themes and ideas, but you have the, the exhilaration and the interest of novelty and uh, surprise and uh, engagement. And uh, I just saw the movie Knives Out. And uh, um, I don't know, you may not like it. Have you seen it? I, I have not seen it. Yeah, no. You're too busy. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I really liked it, though, but I thought it was sort of a marriage of something old and something new you know it was a very much an agatha christie movie but given kind of its own new spin and both in terms of plot things and storytelling things and and i think it's i hope it continues to do well it was really fun to see is there is there a feeling that you reach personally when you know that something is done well or right when you're working on something well our we, you know we have in-house screenings while we're making these films yeah. And again, I, I some people know, oh, yeah, we had eight screenings on this. We had six on that. So I don't know. I can't keep track of it. But there is a, a rhyme and reason to it. And we had certainly in the Pixar era, you know, 
we had there were more screenings than there were even in the in the Jeffrey era. We didn't screen the movie as often at, at that time. Screen the whole movie. Part of the Pixarian system seemed to be get it all up there and tear it apart and rebuild mm. a lot of it. Keep remake refashioning the story to try and improve the story. Um, we get notes at those internal screenings from the staff. We encourage them to give notes. And, uh, and we have sessions right after with, you know, a brain trust of directors and writers and uh, people that uh, sit around a table and pick the movie apart and hopefully give you ideas to improve it. But then you get handwritten notes from other people that aren't at that meeting who say, you know, I like this, I didn't like this, start over, I hated this, whatever. And then you re we read them all. And out of that, you hope to get some ob objectivity, you know, the thing that you struggle with the most. And and what helps most, obviously, if there seems to be kind of a consensus. I mean, we're, we're making movies that are meant to be a popular art form. It isn't like, I don't care if nobody gets this. I get it. That's yeah. all that counts. We're making movies that cost a lot of money to make. They're made for a mass audience. They need to work for an audience. If the audience disengages doesn't get it, whatever, that's a problem. <laughs> so uh, so I think that's a reasonable thing to say, do people, are they engaged? Are they involved? Are they bored? Are they invested? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, if, and if they are not, then you start this whole process, which we learned uh, to a certain extent, one of the big challenges always is, is the idea wrong you know some other something inherent in the idea that is wrong that i it just doesn't work or the character or whatever or is it the communication of that idea that's got a problem and no the idea is fine but there's something either before the idea and even in the string of beads you have bead number c or letter c is fine but b is out of arc you know it's like not in the right spot to follow the line to see you're you're sending us over here and we can't get back over there. So that's part of what we had to do when we were making the films, is still trying to figure out where where there are problems. Are they problems of communication? Are they problems? No, there's right. something in the idea that's faulty or that needs, you know, uh, and that's that, so that was always a challenge to try and figure out. So you'll use the screenings to figure out if, if everything's landing properly, I guess. Right, and, then, yeah, and uh, then we don't really have public previews until the end of the line, and by then, usually you can't make major changes or if you did, you'd have to miss your release date and that costs a lot of money and time. And that's like DEF CON 4, particularly if they have, you know, they're just set up, there's promotional things that are tied to the release. They've got films lined up. It's a certain window where they know what films it's competing against. So that was an anathema. Generally, they would be willing to spend overtime to make sure the film made its release date. You know, they would add money to the budget sometimes to make sure they didn't miss the date. But, um, but it really wouldn't be shown until I would say at the earliest, maybe six ish months back in the day, like little mermaid. I think we screened as I recall, maybe in the summer of 1989 in the early part of that summer, the movie's coming out in November. So what that was, you know, maybe five months before the release of the film to my recollection, that was the first time it was shown publicly at all. And out of that, then they do research groups, you know, they do cards, they do, you know, they take numbers, you know, how, what's the percent recommend, uh, <laughs> which character did you like the best? It's all gets, the data gets crunched. And there was a service that did that and they used them for all the movies. And that's the most harrowing thing you could imagine, you know, going yeah. to this movie you've been working on for three years. And now if they don't like it, God help you, what, you know, what, what can come? And fortunately, most of them survived those first previews, but each preview, in theory, you're, you previewed a couple of times often and you make some adjustments after your first preview, you learn things and you try and address things and you put it back out there and see if it fixes things. The trick, too, is, you know, you're showing unfinished film. You're showing an animation that is pencil test and that they would always do the spiel ahead of time. What you are going to see is a work in progress and it is black and white. But when you see it in the theater, it will be all be in color just the way you normally see it. And da, 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 da. You can say that, but does people do people yeah. literally you know understand? Sometimes even just we'd have to trade out we'd straight trade out animation for storyboard drawings even occasionally because the animation was transparent. You know, it was backlit animation. You couldn't see it very well. The storyboard seemed to communicate the story point clearer, even though ultimately the animation would. But it was in a state, an in between state where people are going to get lost. I think Roger Rabbit supposedly I think had a disastrous early preview where. You know, not much of the combination of the animation and the live action was in there. So the audiences couldn't get a fix on that at all. And it was just the numbers were terrible. And it was like, you know, burn the cards. Don't show anybody what just happened. 
so it, it is a challenge because yeah, you've worked in the dark for a long time and you don't really the, the staff loses their objectivity over a series of screenings. You know, they're in some ways most valuable in the first few, but then they've seen it a few times and they're a bit co-opted by it. They still have good ideas, but everybody gets kind of you can get lost in the woods a little so, bit. So so maybe this is a good segue into kind of what you're doing now as you're retired, by the way. Congratulations on yes, retiring. Retired. Uh, yeah, so I am, that's an interesting thing um, because I am. Well, because I, I wanted to ask, is this new project, are you doing it for yourself and putting all your ideas in there or are you creating it with an audience in mind? Well, that's an excellent question. And I would say somewhere in between those two. I'm, I'm not, it's financed by myself. So, and that's part of the appeal that I, as much creative freedom as I had at Disney uh, under the various regimes, and I say regime in an affectionate way, um, I uh, I still, there were certain limits, you know, things that we could get outvoted on. And on this one, at least to this point, it was appealing to me. I'd like to do a film where I'm, I can't get outvoted. I'm going to stand or fall on my choices, you know, much like a student film in a way. So in a way it's like, I'm, I've reverted. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to that. Um, I am making a film that I'm hoping audiences will like, though. I'm not making a film that's just for me. I'm making a film that I like and that I think is funny. It's a cartoony sort of little short. It's a three and a half minute thing. It's based on a song that I've heard a long time ago that I always thought that would be fun to see in animation. It is, like I say, it's a comedy. It is not going to cure cancer. It's not going to solve the world's problems. It's a very light, breezy entertainment and I think hopefully would be fun to watch. And uh, you won't be bored by it. And you might actually laugh. And it's <laughs> it's musical. It's singing. It's dancing. It's those things, things that I like in animation. Uh, and it's meant to be funny. So... Uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to animate the whole thing myself. We'll see. I've animated about 15 shots so far. I'm trying to tie some down right now that are very batted out, and that's been its own challenge. Um, but it's been fun. And uh, But I have that conflict even in my own head. How much do I want to, while it's the paint, you know, while I can manipulate, how much do I want to show people to get some objectivity because I'm too close to it, you know? And, right. and yeah. not, will I... And that's terrifying to me, although I have shown it to my family, some of my family so far. Uh, my son saw it. My wife has seen it. And then a few of the people who've helped me. I've, I have a few people helping me. A lab person's helping me and a vis dev person's helping me. They saw it. They've each given me ideas that I think have made it better. You know, that it, I'm like, yeah, that's a cool idea. So I'm doing in a way what I did with Disney where it's like, yeah, that's a better idea than what I had. And I'm changing things to accommodate that. Um, but I haven't. But it's like, you know, part of me says, well, and even in terms of my own animation, I could show it to some animators I know who are a brilliant animators, but that thought terrifies me. You know, it's just, I yeah. feel like, I feel like I want to keep making the movie and I don't want to even, even in the old days, it was funny when we were working on Fox and the Hound, uh, you know, this Brad Bird was an animator at Disney for a while before he kind of left because they weren't happy and he wasn't happy. And he was an animator on Fox and the Hound and he was in the room next to me. And so was Jerry Reese. And they were kind of a partnership, Jerry and Brad. They later went off to try and start their own film. Well, as we had done with Cal Arts, when I would do animation, sometimes I, it, you were encouraged, like show it to your colleagues, get some feedback, get some, you know, some objectivity. So I would sometimes show it to Brad and I would sometimes show it to Jerry, my scenes that I was working on. Well, with Brad, I would show him the scenes and this was my recollection that, you know, I would show it, it wasn't finished, but certainly I had I'd committed fairly heavily to a certain approach to a scene of animation. And his notes invariably would be sort of like, wouldn't it be better if you did it? And basically, I mean, throwing out everything I had done. Oh, no. And I, in fact, sometimes thought, yeah, that would be better. But I just worked three weeks on this shot. I'm not throwing. I cannot throw it. I yeah. discovered Jerry Reese, on the other hand, could look at your shot and give you ideas for making what you did better, you know, like uh. within what you had done. And he would say, you know, if you had more time here, or a little more clarity here or whatever it might be, I think just and you'd go, yes, that does make it better. And I'm not throwing out three weeks of work. So I stopped asking Brad what he thought because I didn't, I, it was too painful. You know, I'd be like, okay, yeah, that's a better idea. But I just, I told him I'd have the scene done like at the end of next week. If I start over, there's no way I'm going to do it. So, and I don't even know if the, your idea is better. I got to sell them on your idea now. And I don't even know if they like, I like your idea, but uh, so, uh, so anyway, so yeah, with me, I, I'm running that thing now where I have actually reanimated some of my own shots where I've looked at it, you know, after having done it. And I'm like, I'm like eh, no, what? There's something wrong. And sometimes it doesn't hit me right away. But a few weeks later, I'm like, yeah, that's no, this, 
I did this wrong. I should, the camera's moving too early. I'm not long enough in this pose. I da 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 da, and, and I make fixes, and then I think it's better until you know a few weeks after that. And I'm like, was that better? And I, I, I do generally save the older versions too, but, um, but it's been fun that way, actually. And I do feel like it's been, as I see things particularly, where I feel like, no, that's better. At least I do feel like, yes, this, in my own head, if nowhere else, this is better than that. <laughs> Uh, for a definite reason, I think, and, but I'm, but I still, I'm trying to be objective. It's like, you know, I watch it, you know, a dozen times. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, I think it's better. So it's, it's torture, but it's, it's fun. That's encouraging to hear that. I mean, I go through a lot of those motions myself. Dude, and yes. Uh, I, I, I'm here to tell you, unfortunately, I mean, some people may not have that kind of angst. I have that angst and that insecurity or whatever. Also, there's different directors. I would say Ron and I's directing style. We had strong ideas, but we were very collaborative directors. And partly because when I came out with Cauldron, the director I was with didn't seem to like any of my ideas nor encourage yeah. me to offer ideas. My thing was, if I ever became a director, I would be a collaborative guy. So that was my approach. That was Ron's approach, too. We felt like people should invest themselves in it. If they come up with an idea that's better than the one we have and you know, we can accommodate it, it hasn't gotten too far down the line, we should use their idea because it'll make the movie better and yeah. they'll put more of themselves into it and it'll more quality and so that's, been that's a great piece of advice there are, there are other directors who the movie really does sort of exist in their heads you know they really have envisioned it and other people become extensions of their wrist you know both in live action and animation they have such a clear vision that everybody is trying to put the movie on the screen that the director has in their head and get it there and uh, and one isn't really more legitimate than the other They're totally legitimate it's just what your own sensibilities are and mine are more in the collaborative thing like i say <laughs> given right now i'm a collaboration of one to two or three people but uh uh but i like i, I like i like the collaborative nature part of that group from for me i did uh community theater so to speak in high school and i acted in a little bit and i got involved with this group of friends and we built the sets and i drew the programs and we did you know everything and it was that basic, we're going to put on a show kind of a thing, practically. But it was fun. It was very collegial. It was very collaborative. It was very communal. And there's something about art that's very lonely. I think, you know, that being right. that's what drew me to animation to come around full circle a little bit. Although with what I'm doing, it's not so communal now. But the idea that uh, working with a group of artists and that the artist, that what you make is greater than the sum of the individual parts. And I feel like most of the films I made at Disney they've been enriched by this collaborative thing at times you know i may have lost a few things along the way story ideas or something that yes i got outvoted on this or that that i wish was still there and yet overall uh, the film is enriched by this process um so i i i like the collaborative nature of theater and that carried over into when i was at cal arts we were collaborative and then uh you know at disney there were times where we weren't at all collaborative but i liked it when we were and that's what we tried to do in the films that we were supervising. So maybe as a, a final word, what, what yeah. piece of advice would you give someone who's uh, entering into the animation industry or yeah. looking to build their career further? Looking back. Well, it seems like, and I'm not the best judge of this, but I do feel like with these streaming services right now, the iron is hot. So that's a good thing <laughs> in terms of timing. Like our time getting into Disney was totally fortuitous. You know, the older generations all nearing retirement age, they need young people. We happen to be on the doorstep at that moment. I feel like right now with these streaming things, I mean, the the, the streaming bubble may go away. There may be a you know a, a terrible, uh, catastrophic bloodletting at some point. But at the moment, I feel like a lot of people want to get into animation. And certainly, we're talking on the weekend where Frozen has just made you know over a week in, in whatever it's been now, a week and a half. It's made like eight hundred million dollars. So yep. so that's Frozen. But still, other films too. I mean. The idea that Sergio was able to do his movie Klaus with Netflix and other sort of independent type animation films, uh, Green Eggs and Ham being done for television, which has semi full animation. It seems like a full animation. Uh, Henry's doing a stop motion film up in Portland right now. Um, and these TV shows that are very creative and fun, uh, creator driven in some cases. So a young person who's studying animation right now, I think there are various, and then there's the whole game industry and, unknown uses for animation, all that is to the good. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in animation, uh, take heart in all that. 
beyond that, for me, and I'm a bit of a dinosaur, I still feel like drawing is a skill to try and develop regardless of what type of animation you're going to do. Even if you're going to do CG, even if you're going to do stop motion animation, I think being able to express yourself quickly, clearly, and graphically uh, is a good thing. And I think it's being able to, having a strong background sketching, like they said in my very first portfolio, sketching animals and people in motion, where you've really got to quickly get an act, you know, an attitude, an idea in a drawing, and what, how, what, what lines do you put down? What's the minimal lines you can put down to convey a very powerful statement, a very positive statement of what that action is, what that emotion is, what that character is, what that story point is? All of those things, if you can graphically communicate those things, I think that's a great skill to have. So I would, if I was, I would recommend anybody. Try and develop your drawing chops with drawing classes, with sketchbooks. In corollary with that, it applies to both to whatever field you might be interested in. If you're interested in storyboarding, character design, visual development, uh, directing, anime, be your own worst critic. I mean, don't be be hard on yourself. I think and try and get objectivity about your own work. Be willing to show it to other people so that you get feedback. So that you can. Everybody has blind spots and. The, whatever you can do to help you get past those blind spots, your work will improve the more, the more quickly you get beyond those. And uh, so I think being willing to take criticism, it's a skill that you're going to need if you're going to work in the animation industry, hopefully constructive criticism, but you have to learn how to accept input and maybe even process, perhaps even distinguish, okay, here's the feedback I'm getting, but the real thing they're saying is this, you know, here's their solution. But what they're really talking about is this problem. I have a different solution to that problem. I'll pitch back to them that I think will address their problem was really the heart of it. Their solution I'm not so crazy about. But developing that skill set of being able to take criticism, find solutions, hmm. like, like in any field, um, try and be good at following things up. Uh, don't let things go by the wayside. You know, I mean, if, whatever it might be, if it's your own film, if it's, uh, a project, if there was something you were supposed to do, have done, you have a better chance of uh, advancing within the industry if you are someone that people can count on and you don't flake out. So uh, really following through when you've got a task. Uh, the other challenge many times is if you get to do something really good, they may want you to do that over and over again because you're good at that one thing. You're like, well, I'm good at this, but what I really want to do is that. You know, right. yeah. That's always one of those challenges. But I would say... That's not an excuse to do poorly at the first thing. Uh, I say that as a person who failed my cleanup in between test, but uh, <laughs> and I, Brad Bird and I both failed. We tried, I swear we did, but uh, when they were working on Pete's Dragon, they, uh, they desperately needed help cleaning up because they had a deadline and they needed every available person to draw. So they gave us a cleanup test in between and we both failed. And we neither one of us tried to fail. We just couldn't do it. I still can't do it. I can't draw a cleanup in between. I, like my line is too scratchy. I can't, I don't have the motor skills and any of that stuff. But Henry Selleck, you know, he could do it. And so he got, so he's like, you threw the test. You deliberately sandboxed, you sandbagged it. We didn't. We're just bad. <laughs> um, but I would say develop, be good, try and find at least one thing that you're really good at, but keep your eye on other things if you want to do them. And don't try and imitate other people, but certainly look at work that you think that you like and try and figure out what makes it work, you know, without trying to repeat it necessarily. But there are, I think there are nuts and bolts sort of things. Like if you see a sequence in a film, live action or animation, you're like, there was something really that involved me in it to reverse engineer it, go back and look at it again, pick it apart. How was it staged? How long were the shots? Where were the characters in the shots? What was the, where were the film making, the film graphic choices? What were the performance choices? What are the acting choices? Why did they do this? What, what, you know, how, why, do, if I feel emotion here, what is it that's helping me feel emotion here? Why did I get that rush of emotion here? What is it, you know, without trying to kill the patient, but trying to dig into what are the chops you need to elicit the response you want? You know, how do you develop those chops? And, uh, and try and get objective where your chops aren't is good enough. If you show your work to other people, you can be convinced sometimes. I know what I'm saying is X, Y, or Z, and it's very clear. And you show it to somebody, and they don't get X, Y, or Z at all. And you're shocked. You're like, How can you not get that? 
And then you realize, oh, okay, there's this other thing in the corner of the frame that their eye is going to, or there's this story point that they're still concerned about, or they didn't have enough time to let this register or to really feel the emotion of it for this other thing to land, or there's just some contradictory thing going on, or whatever. It could be any one of many things, but trying to develop uh, an objective sense about your own work and what works and what doesn't. I think it will stand you well, no matter what aspect of film production or a creative enterprise you go into, assuming you go into a creative enterprise that is a mass medium where you are trying to communicate, your success depends to a certain extent on how well you communicate something to an entity that is not you. Uh, so I asked you for one piece of advice. Yeah, okay. And I got, That's I the got problem. seven, I wrote them what? all down. First one is get well, into industry. It's okay, I would say, and uh, follow your passion. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, have fun. I mean, have fun. I mean, this is not, this is, shouldn't, if somehow out of all this, you can't wait. Oh, like Richard Williams, of course, he had the advice I was hearing the other day. Like people say, you know, like, uh, this is really hard. So you shouldn't do it. Like, you know, and he's like, no, it's good because it's hard. You know, and that sort of thing. Um, I don't necessarily describe it. I think I feel like, uh, uh, through the course of this, um, keep a sense of fun alive. You know, and I think the best, Certainly, the best animation from whatever source, even even the more serious animation, there's some feeling of uh, joy. Might be too strong a word, but uh, excitement. The creative person that was behind it, engaging in the material. Oh yeah. Yeah, that you feel when you watch it. You know, you feel their mind and their heart at work, and it connects to yours, and that's just a really electrical connection, and that's really pretty magical, and that can happen. Uh, you know, you, you don't need to analyze it, but if you feel it, you know, it's just amazing. For sure, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, feel, I feel like when I watch an animation, I can tell if the person was having fun yeah. creating it. And yeah. then I feel f like I'm having fun just right, naturally right. on top of I that. Think, uh, I think there is a connection between your head and your hand, whether or not it's on a mouse or it's on a pencil or it's on a stop motion figure. Yeah. And your head, your, your head, your heart, your hand, and the piece of artwork you know that you're creating that you're trying to communicate your idea with so well i think that's uh, all the time we have i know that i think uh, it is yes. <laughs> yeah. okay well well I'm sorry for whatever i said don't but, don't sure. apologize thank you so much for coming on the podcast it's been I, a pleasure. I, I wish, I, wish I could have listened more i i really enjoyed hearing all the little anecdotal stories that you don't get from a you know a textbook yeah, they or, all Wikipedia or something you know well you heard them straight from the horse's mouth. Um, <laughs> so uh, good luck with your film and with the, the rest of the school year. And uh, have uh, a Merry Christmas. Have yourself a Merry Little Christmas. And, you too. Uh, Merry Christmas. And at some point, you'll send me a link to where I can find this. And I don't yes. know. Yes. Well, I I, uh, watch I still have to sign off. So if you're listening to this podcast and you want to follow John's work, he is working on a short film, and he's going to be coming out with that. I don't know when, but you can look. Who knows that? But when when I finish it. You guys will be the first to know. Yeah, exactly. Or if you're super interested, uh, he said you can search him on Facebook or look up his production company, which is Scribbly Pictures. And uh, that's all for now. So thank you so much for listening. Okay, bye. Okay.